Welcome to Health Time TV, and today we will be talking about cosmetic surgery with Dr. V from South Shore Plastic Surgery. Thank you for joining us today. Absolutely, John. Thank you for having me. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and about your practice? My name is Dr. Vashist. Uh, a lot of people call me Dr. V. Nickname that I think I've attained in the last five, six years has stuck with me pretty well. Uh, I'm board certified by the American Board of Plastic Surgery, member of the American Society of Plastic Surgeons. Uh, I'm also a fellow of the American College of Surgeons. And uh, last, say, five, six years, my practice has become mainly cosmetic surgery. Tell me, how did you get interested in cosmetic surgery? I would probably say that cosmetic surgery got interested in me. Uh, it's one of those things that you, you in plastic surgery, you, you tend to do a lot of different types of procedures, and the practice tends to focus in one or another way. And my practice in the last five, six years tended to direct itself towards cosmetic surgery. And in all honesty, I think you have to be pretty good at doing cosmetic surgery. And so far, I've had pretty good luck with it. So I just took it into the direction of cosmetic surgery. So many people do not know, what is the difference between a plastic surgeon and a cosmetic surgeon? Good question. Plastic surgery is a very broad field. Uh, it encompasses literally from head to toe. Uh, we are trained to uh, do surgery that involves mainly reconstructive surgery. Mm -hmm. Cosmetic surgery is a small branch of the larger plastic surgery uh, specialty. Okay. Uh, probably, I would say, about 10% of plastic surgery is cosmetic surgery. At South Shore, what are some of the cosmetic surgery procedures that you offer? The, the world of cosmetic surgery basically has two branches, uh, in my opinion. There's a surgical branch, and then there's a non-surgical branch. Surgical procedures like rhinoplasty, facelift, breast augmentation, any kind of breast enhancement that includes breast lift, breast reduction, body contouring operations like tummy tucks, liposuction, uh, men and women alike, Non-surgical uh, options, which is becoming very popular now, includes things like Botox, injectable fillers uh, for volume enhancement, um, laser resurfacing. I also have a, a laser center in my office, and I offer a lot of laser resurfacing procedures. So it's a combination of surgical and non-surgical practice, which allows me to be broad spectrum and, and give patients options. What is the most common procedure that you perform at your office? Two words, breast augmentation. In 2009, the statistics from the American Society of Aesthetic Plastic Surgeons came out, showed that breast augmentation finally caught up to liposuction as the number one cosmetic procedure that's performed in the U.S. And in my practice, that definitely pans out. So most likely, uh, the answer to that question really is breast augmentation surgery. What is breast augmentation? Breast augmentation or breast enhancement is basically any surgery that involves improving the appearance of your breast. This may include things like using an implant uh, to improve the size of the breast, to augment the size of the breast. It may also include uh, rearranging and reconstructing the breast to make the, best, the breast appear more cosmetically appealing. Uh, uh, things like breast lifts, Breast reduction sometimes is also necessary uh, in somebody who has breasts is too large. But breast augmentation is somebody who has a small breast that wants to incre increase the size of their breast. We'll be right back with more information on cosmetic surgery with Dr. V when Health Time TV returns. patients do you see that come to you for a breast augmentation? A, volume, and B, projection. Volume is anybody who doesn't have enough volume of breast tissue. So either you're not born with too much volume, so a lot of the younger 20-somethings will come in. Uh, and B is projection. How much does the breast actually stick out from the chest wall? 
And here you're entering the realm of the mommy makeovers, the 30, 40 somethings who've had children, their breast has lost the volume and it's also lost projection. And in either of those patient population, breast augmentation surgery, which is to lift and uh, increase the size of the breast can really improve their appearance. Walk us through a breast augmentation procedure. Here's a 22-year-old patient who just doesn't feel that her breasts are big enough and she just wants an augmentation. Uh, basically, we take uh, an artificial implant. Uh, there's basically two types of implants, either saline implants or gel silicone implant. Could you tell us the difference between those two? Saline implant is basically a shell made out of, out of a silastic material that's filled with saline, filled a size to the patient's desire and also to the patient's preoperative uh, anatomy. Okay. Gel implant uh, uses same same thing. It's a silastic uh, uh, shell filled with gel material made out of silicone. And in 2007, 2008, it was finally reapproved by the FDA for use as breast augmentation uh, tool. Either you can get a gel implant or you can get a saline implant. The FDA stipulation is that for a patient to get a gel implant, she has to be 22 or over. So if you're 22 or younger, you can only get saline implants. Okay, so once we've picked either saline or gel, how do we then follow through with the procedure? I help them decide what type of implant is right for them, uh, what type of incision they should have. Uh, if they need a lift, the incision option changes. If they don't need a lift, uh, I can make a relatively small incision, hide the incision uh, somewhere on the breast or somewhere in areas other than the breast, uh, access the breast area. I can put an implant behind the muscle or I can put the implant on top of the muscle, which is the chest muscle. Uh, and each one has its pluses and minuses. So when you come in for the consult, my job is to help you figure that out. A lot of people are nervous about going under the knife. Is this safe to have a breast augmentation since it's elective surgery for most part? Yes, one of the things that I deduced from that is how safe we've actually become doing the surgery. Sure. Most patients are scared of two things, pain and anesthesia, especially the young 20-something who's never had surgery. She's otherwise very healthy. Uh, last thing she probably wants is a surgical procedure. Yeah, this is the first major surgery they're yeah. going under, yeah. sure. So from an anesthesia safety profile perspective, it's extremely safe. Our technology from the anesthesia perspective is has really improved quite a bit. From a pain perspective, which I think is extremely important, a lot of women used to be scared of pain from the post-operative breast augmentation. Today, it's virtually eliminated. Uh, I use a pain pump pretty much in all my cases. Pain pump is basically a catheter that I leave behind in the pocket uh, after I'm done with the surgery that for a course of the next three days after the surgery, it automatically deposits pain medication into the pocket numbing medicine, the same stuff the dentist uses. And with that, it has literally revo revolutionized pain. How long does the procedure normally take? If you're just going for straight augmentation, it takes me about an hour and a half or so to do that. Uh, if you need a lift along with an augmentation, so if you're a mommy uh, in your 30s and 40s, you can expect at least add another hour to that. So about two, two and a half hours for that patient. And tell us about post-operative care. How long are we back to doing our daily routine after we have this procedure Like done. I said, it, because of the pain pump, because of some of the changes that we've gone through in the last, I would say, five, 10 years, uh, I can have you back sitting at your desk on Monday if I do your surgery on a Thursday. I mean, literally, uh, you can be sitting at a desk. Now, if you're a nurse or you're working in, or you're lifting things, you may need a little extra time, probably about a week, but I would say no more than a week. That pain pump sounds very interesting, and I wanna talk a little bit more about that when we come back. More with Dr. V on cosmetic surgery when Health Time TV returns.
Welcome back to Health Time TV. Joining us is Dr. V from South Shore Cosmetic Surgery. We were talking a little bit about the pain pump. Sounds like an amazing uh, feature to have for post-op care, especially with breast augmentation. What else do you use the pain pump for? Uh, the pain pump can be used in any kind of major surgery where there's a cavity that we can leave behind a catheter. Uh, basically, the concept is, is that this catheter will deposit pain medicine Sure. typically lidocaine or, or xylocaine, which is basically the same stuff the dentist uses, for a period of a three to five days, depending on how long you leave it in for. And it just basically numbs up the area that you're doing surgery. So breast augmentation is one of my favorite places because it literally makes life a lot easier for patients post-op. Tummy tucks basically leaves big, big cavities behind and we're tightening the muscle inside, which is a very painful procedure. And in tummy tucks, I love to use pain pumps, breast reduction, breast lifts, uh, anywhere where we can use um, uh, uh, this, leave a catheter behind. So those are the types of procedures that I use it for. So you mentioned tummy tuck. Can you go into what exactly is a tummy tuck? A tummy tuck is basically a, a way to tighten and remove skin and fat uh, that a woman can develop in her abdominal area after pregnancy, typically after pregnancy, but also from weight loss as well, uh, where there's a lot of skin excess and liposuction is not going to address that issue in, in most cases. So we need to remove that section of tissue. And literally, I can sculpt a, a female's body, uh, give them back their 20s and 30s uh, with the techniques that I use. So you mentioned liposuction in with it wouldn't do the same thing that a tummy tuck would do. So what is liposuction? Liposuction is basically a technique that has been tried and true uh, uh, technique for improving and contouring the human uh, uh, form, in my opinion. Okay. Uh, basically, you have an area where you have unwanted fat or an area where there's exercise-resistant fat, and you want to remove that fat. We make tiny incisions, and we literally suck out that fat from those areas. Technology has improved so much that we've revolutionized the technique. Now we use laser to help us uh, break the fat down instead of our brawn and our muscle. Uh, we can also use ultrasound sometimes in certain cases to break the fat down. And some of these techniques using laser and ultrasound, we can also use to sculpt the body to the way that we want it to sculpt it to. So for example, I can give you a six pack if that's what you want, if, that, if that's the look that you're looking for, especially in men. And in women, I can sculpt certain parts of their physique, there are certain uh, parts of their body to give them the more of the hourglass shape that they may be looking for. So talk to me about the laser. It seems kind of scary, so talk us through the laser procedure. Laser-assisted liposuction has literally made life a lot easier for a lot of patients who may have been wanting liposuction, but they're a little bit nervous about having something done. Sure. Uh, using the laser, I can uh, do the procedure in an office setting, uh, the same procedure that I would have to take the patient to the surgery center or the OR. Now I can do the same procedure in the office with minimal downtime, uh, tiny, tiny, small incisions as opposed to bigger incisions uh, sure. with liposuction. And I can also tighten the skin with the laser. Who is a candidate for liposuction? The bottom line is skin elasticity. Everything that I do in my profession has to do with skin elasticity. How good is your skin tone? Meaning that if you have an area of fat, and if the skin tone over that area is still well maintained, meaning that you're still relatively young, mm -hmm. uh, and I remove that fat, and I liposuction, whether I use laser, ultrasound, or just straight liposuction, I have to make sure that that skin redrapes over that tissue, over that area. If that skin is too loose, and you don't have good elasticity, and I suction your uh, area that you're interested in, I can actually make things worse. So really the good candidate is somebody that has good skin elasticity, which I think is extremely important. Welcome back to Health Time TV. We are speaking with Dr. V, a cosmetic surgeon from Voorhees, New Jersey. And I wanted to talk about that reality shows are becoming so popular talking about 
plastic surgery and cosmetic surgery. Why do you think it's become such a hot topic? There's a general sense that plastic surgery and cosmetic surgery is becoming safer to do. I think in the past, patients were afraid to undergo a procedure because of safety issues and pain issues, uh, as I alluded to earlier. So I think those things are making it easier for patients to consider cosmetic surgery. But the other thing that I think is happening is Nowadays, the perception of plastic surgery, because of the television shows and things like that, is very different. Patients come to me for big things. They come to me for small things. But when they come to me for some of the smaller things, um, it almost seems to me like they're looking at plastic surgery as, as, as not so much a fear uh, uh, kind of an issue. It's more like, you know, I'm getting my hair done. I'm going to the salon to go get my nails done, and I'm going to go to Dr. V's, get my laser uh, hair removal or my laser resurfacing of my face, uh, maybe get a filler, get something, a Botox, uh, to make myself look better for this particular occasion or that particular occasion in their lives. So I think there's a stigma of that plastic surgery that used to be there five, ten years ago is now getting less and less and less, and patients are much more uh, prone to getting plastic surgery because they just want it. They look better. And, the, and I think the results are becoming much better now in terms of what we do and technology that we have. Welcome back to Health Time TV, and now it is time for my favorite segment, Viewer Email, where you, the viewer, can have your questions answered by our medical experts. Please email us at questions at Health Time TV. And now Dr. V is going to take your questions about cosmetic surgery. So are you ready? All right, here we go. Let's start with question number one, Tina in Mount Laurel says, I am a 35-year-old mom. I have two children. How do I know if I need a tummy tuck or liposuction? Very common issue. Probably the biggest factor is skin elasticity. And without examining that patient, without examining Tina, there's no way for me to know which candidate you are. Basically, if you have good elasticity still left, and there's some moms after two, three, four children I've seen that still somehow find a way to maintain good skin elasticity, then oftentimes we just need to liposuction them. But most often, after two children, uh, you'll have not only fat, but also extra skin. It's a good chance that she'll probably need a tummy tuck. Okay, but so without an exam, it's hard to tell. So we need to get her in and come in yep. and see you for an exam. Absolutely. Yep. All right. Shannon in Bucks County writes, I'm 16 years old. I have a large hump on my nose. I'm extremely self-conscious. Should I have surgery? Controversial. Uh, I think the, the jury is still kind of out on this in terms of doing surgery on a young teenage uh, patient uh, who's not quite 18 yet. Uh, the other issue is that she's still young. Her face is still growing. There's still a chance that her face will continue to grow. But then the other issue is she's self-conscious. So what do you do? Well, my answer to that patient is 
probably you can have the most minimal thing done now, which is to resect that hump which is not a major rhinoplasty procedure to just remove a hump and kind of straighten out your nose and give it a little bit more shape. For her, she needs to decide how self-conscious is she and how affected by this is she in her life. And if she is, then surgery is probably the good option for her. Donna in Marlton, after three children, my breasts sag and I hate them. Do I need a lift or implants? Again, Elasticity, elasticity, elasticity is the living, it's what I live in my life. Uh, it all depends on how your tissues have responded after pregnancy and also after nursing. Um, if you have, if your breasts are really sagging and your nipple position is in a position where it's kind of drooping down and facing downwards, if I just went in there and put an implant, it's not going to change the general aesthetics of your breast. So it's a good chance, depending on how bad your, your droopiness, or what we call ptosis, the word that we use is ptosis, depending on how, how totic your breast is, uh, there's a good chance that she will need some kind of a lift, not just an implant. So a combination, what we call a, the procedure that I like to do for that uh, is a circumvertical mastopexy with breast augmentation. Tom in Norristown, Pennsylvania. I have always been self-conscious about my breasts. Do I have gynecomastia? Gynecomastia is probably one of the more common but hidden problems that we see in plastic surgery. Hidden because it's not fun to have gynecomastia when you're a man, but it's a common problem. This typically, uh, the surgery for that can be a combination of liposuction, a little bit of removing a breast tissue, what we call subcutaneous mastectomy, mm -hmm. and it's really, really popular now for me to use my, my laser liposuction for that patient and also sometimes the uh, ultrasound-assisted liposuction. So sometimes I'll throw a mix of bag at the patient depending on how bad their problem is. So we have another question from another gentleman named James, and he's in Medford. He writes to Health Time TV, I go to the gym all the time, and I have an area I just can't get rid of around my waist. Do I need liposuction? And there's always, almost always, an area that just doesn't get better. And usually in men, it's that flank, sort of, you know, lower waist area that just never contours right. Uh, and uh, the other area that men don't like is uh, six-pack. They want a six-pack, but sometimes they just don't have the anatomy for it. And uh, so, yeah, liposuction is probably a good option. And a lot of times we can do it right in the office using our laser-assisted liposuction techniques. That's very interesting. I'm, it's, it's very interesting because a lot of people think women and plastic surgery and cosmetic yeah. surgery and yeah. not men, but you see just as much yeah. we see the a lot men, of men come through. A lot of men. What is the difference between labiaplasty and vaginoplasty? And that's from Dora in Pensacken. There are two basic issues uh, here. The labia, and most women know the anatomy. Uh, a lot of men probably don't know the difference, but the vagina is a larger structure, and within the vaginal uh, uh, vaginal anatomy, there's the labia. Mm -hmm. There's this, uh, uh, the larger labia and the smaller labia. Basically, in a woman, um, sometimes they're born this way, or sometimes after pregnancy and after uh, years of sort of the aging process, the labia actually, one of the labia, will get stretched out and become very redundant. Mm -hmm. And in those patients, uh, that redundant labia is aesthetically not pleasing and also functionally. Uh, they don't have the same sort of joy of the sex process that they used to have when they were younger. And in those patients, a simple labiaplasty uh, can be done a lot of times right in the office, basically just removing that extra skin and extra tissue that's redundant. Okay. Vaginoplasty is a little bit more complex. A vaginoplasty is where the vagina stretches. And a lot of the GYN doctors will treat that more than even we do in plastic surgery. But you've known women who've had children, uh, maybe they had an episiotomy when they were going through their uh, childbirth process and the vagina just stretched out too much. Same thing. It's aesthetically not as pleasing. And also they're not sexually satisfied the way they used to be. And so a lot of times they need to have that vagina sort of made smaller uh, and a lot of that redundant tissue made smaller. But that's a little bit more of an involved procedure. That procedure typically is done uh, by a GYN for the most part. Uh, and also done in an office, um, in a surgery center rather than an office setting. It's coming up on the summertime, so this question is quite perfect. From Phyllis in Medford, I go to the Jersey Shore and my skin is very blotchy. What options do I have? 
women that go to the beach, they go to the shore, they've been going for the, to the shore for years, and over the last 15, 20 years, they've developed you know, all the, the sun damage that um, has accrued on their face. Sun damage is probably the most common cause of that, that botchy skin where you have a lot of brown pigments uh, that develops over the years. Uh, and the best treatment in my practice, anyway, is one of my laser uh, treatments that I do is combination treatment using an IPL or an intense pulse light and another laser called laser genesis, which will improve the texture and tone of the skin. The IPL will address the pigment uh, and that brown blotchy skin. So this, this combination is probably what this woman will need. And it's remarkable. I mean, literally the brown spots disappear right in front of you uh, after about a week to 10 days after the first treatment. This comes from Sheila in Ardmore. She says, I'm 22 and I'm happy with the size of my breasts, but both of my nipples are inverted. What can I do? Chances are that she just has a congenitally inverted nipple. It just means that the tissue kind of crowds over the nipple, the actual nipple. Okay. The procedure to have this fixed is relatively easy and simple. It's done right in the office under local anesthesia. Basically, we go in there and just release the tissue that is actually holding the nipple in, in an inverted position. And by releasing that tissue, uh, we can actually make the nipple come back out. Uh, and uh, then we can do, we do certain types of techniques to make sure that that doesn't happen again. Because the chances are that if you don't do it correctly, the nipple will go back to its normal inverted position. So we do the surgery, release it, and then we, we, we do certain techniques to make sure that it stays out. If you have questions for our medical expert, please email us at questions at healthtimetv.com. And thank you for joining us today.